Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Now, this may surprise you to know, but ships sink. It's a unfortunate fact of life for naval engineers around the world. But it's also great news for divers. Sunken vessels have given intrepid underwater explorers some very interesting things to look at. Today, I've partnered with Getty Images again to look through their archive and find you some very interesting footage. Here are five amazing wrecks and their stories. SS Umbria Not to be confused with the Cunard liner of the same name, the ship is often considered one of the best and most beautiful shipwreck dives in the world. The SS Umbria is located just off Port Sudan in the Red Sea, resting on her port side on about a 60 degree angle in relatively shallow waters. She makes for not only an easy expedition for experienced and beginner divers alike, but also an extremely interesting one. You see, the Umbria is a veritable treasure trove of relics and artifacts, all of which can be safely explored within the span of just a single dive. But aside from the allure of a shallow and decently intact shipwreck, what is it about the Umbria that's so appealing to ship enthusiasts, wartime historians and ocean explorers alike? Well, it's an interesting story. It all began in Hamburg, Germany in 1912, when the ship started out life as a cargo and passenger steamer dubbed the Bahia Blanca. A few short years later though, she changed hands, coming under the ownership of the Argentinian government for use as a transport ship. In 1935, however, she was acquired by the Italian government to be used as a wartime cargo and troop transport vessel and given the name Umbria. It was during this time that the fires of the Second World War were beginning to ignite and our fair Umbria was caught in the crossfire. In June of 1940, while Italy was still neutral at the time, there were whispers that this was going to change and soon. The Umbria, having anchored in Port Sudan to resupply, was detained by two British ships, the HMS Grisby and the HMS Leander. Realising that Italy was heading for entry into the war, the British ships wanted to search the Italian vessel for contraband and smuggled goods. However, word of Italy's entry into the war travelled to Umbria's captain, who knew immediately that he needed a plan to save his crew and cargo, and fast. The British ships gave him permission to call a muster drill, or an evacuation drill, a ruse that he used to safely get his crew off the ship. He then turned his attention to the cargo, a whopping 6,000 tonnes of bombs, 600 cases of detonators, 100 tonnes of various weapons, and over 2,000 tonnes of cement, and three Fiat 1100 cars. Knowing it was imperative to keep this all out of the hands of the enemy, the captain boldly opted to sink his own ship. With the help of two engineers who remained on board, he opened the sea valves and allowed the ship and all of its precious cargo on board to flood and slowly sink beneath the surface. To this day, divers can marvel at the intact wine bottles, machinery, munitions, and even vehicles left on board the Umbria. Most famously, 360,000 individual aircraft bombs remain in the hold of the ship. And while they do not have detonators equipped, divers are encouraged to tread very carefully, as the highly explosive material still has the potential for massive damage should they ever successfully detonate. A timeless display of the audacity and courage of one sea captain and his vessel caught in the crossfires of a war, whose story is told amidst a haunting wreckage, which will continue to transfix explorers and historians for years to come. Portland. Now it's hardly uncommon to hear of tales of ships lost in battles with rough weather, and the Portland is a very unfortunate example of this. Resting at just over 450 feet below the surface of the Atlantic, off the coast of Massachusetts, the wreck was considered lost for over 110 years, until 2002, when the NOAA, or National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, used remotely operated underwater exploration vehicles to photograph the wreck, confirming her final resting place. She was still largely intact, and the expedition reportedly found artifacts such as dinnerware and utensils, as well as sea life thriving upon her once proud side paddle wheels. But of course, every shipwreck has a story, and this one is that of the Portland, who would soon become known as the Titanic of New England. Built in 1889 by the New England Company to transport passengers between Boston, Massachusetts and Portland, Maine, the Portland was widely considered one of New England's largest and most luxurious paddle steamers. Her nine-year career travelling back and forth between Portland and Boston had earned her a reputation as an exceedingly safe vessel, having dependably weathered all manner of choppy or stormy seas. However, in November of 1898, while travelling her typical route and carrying some 200 passengers aboard, 
a perfect storm began to brew off the New England coast, unbeknownst to her captain and crew. This was a time well before the advent of radio communication and radar, so the crew truly had no warning of the impending doom they were to reckon with. Before long, the ship was swept up in a massive blizzard which generated 100 mile per hour winds and 60 foot waves that devastated everything in their path, including, most notably, the Portland herself. The catastrophe led to the storm even being dubbed the Portland Gale after the tragic loss of the ship and all lives on board. To this day, we're still unsure of exactly how many passengers were traveling on board the Portland that day as the only copy of the passenger list was also on the ship when she founded. This oversight led to the policy of all ships leaving a second copy of their passenger manifest on shore in case of emergency. But the truly amazing facet of this tragedy is of course how long the shipwreck remained lost. There were some accounts of divers coming across the remains of the vessel as early as 1945, but these claims were mainly unsubstantiated. No one truly had definitive proof of the ship's whereabouts until almost 60 years later in 2002. And then, in 2008, a group of experienced divers set out to explore the Portland firsthand. And dives to the Portland had to be cut short, resulting in very little in the way of salvage. Dive lights were said to have imploded due to the pressure, and the divers needed to return to the surface after just about 10 minutes on the wreck. All told, the location of the wreck of the Portland remained an unsolved mystery for almost a quarter of a century longer than Titanic, earning her place among the National Register of Historic Places in 2005. Not all sunken ships are particularly old and historical. There's one that comes to mind that we've actually touched on before on this channel that happened within the last 20 or so years. Rising out of the shallow waters and dense foliage of a tropical jungle, you'll find a modern cruise ship resting on her side and overgrown with greenery. She is the MV World Discoverer. The ship was built in Germany in 1974 as a dedicated cruise ship designed to be small enough to offer unprecedented access to exotic locations where larger ships just couldn't go. The Discoverer was only 85.7 meters or 287 feet long, and a gross tonnage of just 3,724 tons. This little ship boasted a 13,000 kilometer cruising range and she used it to good effect, offering intimate cruises to the Falkland Islands, South America and the South Pacific. One of its real strengths though was cruising in the ice. The ship was rated to sail through ice flows and frequently offered cruises to Antarctica or the Arctic Circle. The World Discoverer even carried a small collection of rubber dinghies so passengers could paddle out for a closer look at the ice flows and glaciers on display. But it wasn't in the ice that the ship ran into trouble though. On April 30th, 2000, the World Discoverer was sailing around the Solomon Islands when it dragged its hull over a massive uncharted rock or reef. The object penetrated the ship's double hull so water began pouring in immediately and the ship's captain had to act fast, collecting all the ship's passengers as she slowly sank. With all its passengers safe and off the ship, the World Discoverer had developed a bad list over to the side so her captain tried his best to save his ship from sinking by beaching it in the soft sand of an island. Unfortunately though, the beaching was a little too thorough and the ship was written off as a total loss. It eventually lent over to 46 degrees on its starboard side and it still sits like this today. Incredibly, the World Discoverer has never been broken up for scrap or salvage and it just sits on its side, abandoned in a tropical paradise. Plants have now taken root in the ship's superstructure and palm trees grow out of its decks. Salem Express. This wreck is a controversial dive site because its loss resulted in the deaths of hundreds of her passengers. She had originally been built in the 1960s for the French company General Transatlantique as the MV Fred Scamaroni, a roll-on roll-off ferry of intermediate size. She changed hands a half dozen times leading up to the late 1980s when she had been renamed Salem Express. She was Egyptian owned and operated running between Suez and Jeddah and in 1991, on what would become her final voyage, the ship was loaded with passengers and cars and set off with many of her complement returning from Mecca in a holiday mood. After deviating from her course, however, the Salem Express ran aground on a coral reef and ripped a huge gash in the hull. She sank within just 20 minutes and the speed of the sinking caused a panic. Only one lifeboat was successfully launched. Most of the victims were trapped inside the hull and the exact number of those lost remains in dispute to this day. Lloyds claimed that there were 644 passengers and only 180 survivors, although the number of those lost may have been way higher than this. 
One source puts the number of dead at 850. Only 10 of 71 crew members survived. Some had gone back to try to help passengers before becoming trapped themselves. The wreck sits at just over 30 meters or 100 feet deep and lies perfectly on her side. Diving the Salem Express is controversial within the dive community because of the large loss of civilian life, and all through the ship the touching evidence of those lost is clear. In the passenger areas, dozens of bags and pieces of luggage remain unclaimed and stuffed full of gifts intended for family and friends. In the car bays, vehicles still sit on their sides with their paint scheme still showing. The bicycle is intact down there as well. Many access points for the vessel were welded over, but some can still gain access inside, although the number of human remains within the corridors and rooms inside the ship would be overwhelming even for a seasoned diver. Unfortunately though, some divers have opened the suitcases and retrieved artifacts as souvenirs. The Submarine Ruby Sticking out of the silt over 100 feet down off Saint-Tropez in France, you might be surprised to see the bow section of a very well-preserved submarine sticking out of the silt. Potentially even forgiven for thinking this is a German U-boat, but it's actually a French vessel with a very interesting story. The French Navy had some good experience with building submarines. They built a fascinating cruiser submarine armed with 8-inch guns in the 20s named Surcouf. But while the French Admiralty was messing around with novel designs like that, they were also creating a fleet of reliable, trusted vessels that included the submarine Ruby. She was a Safir-class sub, one of six built in the 20s and 30s for the French Navy, capable of attacking with torpedoes and even laying mines without needing to surface. The ship received action and even awards during the Second World War, sinking with both mines and torpedoes no fewer than 22 ships, equating to 21,000 gross registered tons. It was an impressive tally, but it wasn't enough to save Ruby from the existential threat of peacetime when many ships and submarines were taken apart for scrap. But Ruby would prove useful to the French outside of war, first as a training ship in Toulon, and finally as a sonar target. In 1958, Ruby was towed off the French coast and sunk to conduct anti-submarine training. But her shallow depth and ease of access has made her, today, a popular dive site. And what a sight it is. Sitting upright on the sea floor is the intact hull of Ruby. The bow is unmistakable, but so is the conning tower. The lighter still plating around the tower has since corroded through, revealing tanks and equipment, and at the after end the propeller shafts still stick out of the hull, and the rudder is even still in place, although the valuable bronze propellers themselves were removed before she was scuttled. It's probably not just the Ruby's condition that makes her a popular dive site though. I can think of a few worse places to base yourself for a diving trip than sunny Saint-Tropez. HMS Majestic and E-14 Now we come to a veritable graveyard of ships. The Dardanelles campaign in the First World War claimed a large number of British warships when they were caught out by nets, mines and naval batteries in the narrow waterways and shallow coasts around Cape Hellas in Turkey. With the First World War raging, some in the British Admiralty and government thought that the quickest way to bring the conflict to a close was to invade the Central Powers from the south by initiating an amphibious invasion of Turkey at Gallipoli. The plan called for a lot of daring do, but it failed to account for the Turks' defensive capabilities. They had extensively mined and defended huge portions of the peninsula, but the plans went ahead anyway, and what resulted on land at Gallipoli is now known as one of the most infamous military slaughters of modern history. But at sea, things weren't much better. Patrolling German submarines picked hapless warships off while others sailed straight into mines. And to this end, the seafloor here is littered with interesting wrecks, and one of these is HMS Majestic. Majestic is fascinating for being one of the few pre-dreadnought battleship wrecks in the world. Launched in 1895, the warship was fairly powerful for its day, with four 12-inch or 305mm guns in twin turrets. In 1897, she was a highlight of the Spithead Royal Navy Review, and served as flagship a few times, but by 1915 was hopelessly outdated. She was assigned to help protect the Dardanelles invasion force, and was ominously outfitted with mine-catching gear to clear the way, and for her part she engaged the Turkish defence as well, being among the first three ships to circumnavigate the entrance to the Dardanelles and bomb Turkish positions, she even received a hit from the enemy. 
On May 27th, though, her luck ran out. The German submarine U-21 spotted her and fired a single torpedo, which hit and caused a huge explosion. The old battleship rolled over and in just nine minutes had completely capsized, taking almost 50 men with her. Her masts and superstructure hit the seabed and stuck, so she didn't sink entirely for many months yet, with her underside pointing perversely up into the air, but then she finally settled and sank beneath the waves. Today, much of the warship's structure remains intact, and you can even see in this dive footage what looks to be the blank void and casing that might have led down to ventilate the engine room. Elsewhere, still rising up out of the tangle of twisted steel, looks to be part of one of the ship's smokestacks. Elsewhere, you can find the hulk of the submarine HMS E-14, an intrepid vessel which had actually successfully evaded detection, sneaking into the Sea of Marmara in 1915. She sank a gunboat and then damaged a heavily laden troop ship, the Ghul Jamal, which in a previous life was the White Star transatlantic liner Germanic. The British thought that she had sunk, but in reality she survived and was eventually repaired and put back into service. Eventually though, HMS E-14's good fortune ran out in 1918 when she was attacking a Turkish merchant ship. One of her own torpedoes detonated just after leaving the tube, forcing E-14 to surface because she was damaged. She was quickly spotted and engaged by shore gun batteries where she was badly damaged again and began to sink. Her crew abandoned ship, but only nine survived, and the wreck was thought lost. It was only in 2012 that E-14 was rediscovered 250 metres or 820 feet from the shore. Only a small part of the bow is visible, rising out of the sand, but crucially, it actually shows a direct hit, possibly showing where the submarine began the flooding that would spell her doom. The wreck is regarded as a war grave, but there are actually 13 other shipwrecks around the Karnakala Strait that divers can today visit and explore. The Turkish government has mapped out the exact location of the wrecks to encourage dive tourism in the area, making something of an inventory so that thrill-seeking divers across the world can come and explore at their leisure. The underwater documentation can also show the rate of decay of the vessel's hulls, and give some idea to archaeologists just how long they can expect to stay around. Each ship offers a fascinating glimpse into the recent past, when men and their steam-powered machines fought for control of the waves. Finally, we'll end on what is potentially one of history's most unlucky ships. Today, you can see part of her bow peeking out from above the waters in Captain Bay, Unalaska, and her story is nothing short of bizarre. Northwestern started out as a steam-powered freighter in 1889, built in Pennsylvania for services around Alaska. From the outset though, the ship earned a reputation for trouble, suffering from groundings and collisions that would last throughout her career. In 1907, the ship first ground on a reef, was refloated and underwent repairs, but she was beached again soon afterward, having developed a leak. She was again refloated, was towed for repairs, but then the tug towing her ran aground in the fog. Later on, she collided with another ship in 1911, and ran aground again in 1910, 1913, 1915, and again years later in 1933. But remarkably, she was refloated every time. I can't tell if this is the luckiest or unluckiest ship in history, but for some reason the US Navy thought it would be good to put this absolute lunatic of a vessel into service during the Second World War, and she was used to house harbour workers in Unalaska, the Aleutian Islands. The Japanese bombed the area in June 1942, but of course, Northwestern was hit, badly damaged, and consumed by flames. She was abandoned and eventually sank on the spot in around 1946 in Captain Bay. Nowadays, a good portion of the Northwestern's hull remains visible and recognisable above the waterline. The bow sticks out, rusted to a dull orange, but you can clearly make out the rough shape of it and the houses for the anchors. On the forward deck, the ship's anchor windlass sits intact where it was fitted 130 years ago, but moving further aft from there, the ship's side plating has begun to fold inward like wet cardboard. If you look closely, you can see the remains of the ship's forward mast, which once stood proudly over the vessel, but now lays draped over its decks, which themselves are covered in a nice dense layer of green turf. Be a nice spot for a picnic. Northwestern is a fascinating ship with a strange story, and her little known wreck, which itself is in such a good state of preservation, is probably one of the most interesting of its kind in the world.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.